Welcome to our deck tech on Briar Queen's Thorns versus Zarbag's Gits. Let's start off by talking about the Briar Queen's Thorns. So, the Briar Queen's Thorns consists of the Briar Queen, Varklov the Cruel, the Ever Hanged, and four Chain Rasps, which makes this a seven fighter team, which is the maximum, barring Zarbag's Gits right now, which has a special ability to get an extra two out of it. Uh, they're definitely a kind of swarmy, slightly objective focused team. Uh, you'll notice they're kind of on the slow end. Uh, they are all threes with the exception of the Everhanged, who starts at four. Uh, and they're a full dodge warband, which makes them a natural target for acrobatics and spectral shield dodge stacking. Um, and their fighting stats aren't that solid on the chain rasps, but the Briar Queen, Varklov, and the Everhanged do a lot of work in a pinch. Uh, their inspiration mechanic is the same for all of them. They have to be adjacent to an enemy fighter at the beginning of their activation. And Varklov the Cruel in particular is a very important piece of making sure this happens. So Varklov has a special action on his card that allows him to push all friendly chain rasps up to two hexes. So this is everyone except for Varklov and the Briar Queen because the Everhanged has an ability that says that he has a chain rasp. And so you are very reliably able to put multiple chain rasps in adjacency to enemy fighters, and they can't kill all of them, so they either need to retreat or just kind of accept that you're going to inspire a few fighters. And when they do inspire, chain rasps all go up to two dodge. So your war band across the board is two dodge, which is a pretty solid defensive stat line once you turn them on. Looking at our primary fighter's offensive stats, we've got the Briar Queen. She starts off with range 2, 3 fury, 2 damage, which is okay, but not great. It'll, it'll do the job against horde fighters, but it's a little bit on the low side. And you'll notice that everyone does 2 damage or less uninspired. But when they do inspire, they get a lot better at fighting. So... In addition to the additional point of dodge that most of the fighters get, everyone goes up to speed 4 if they weren't already. And the Briar Queen and Varklov in particular go up to damage 3, which is a nice little bump. Uh, this means that if you can get some teleportation ploys into the deck, you can very reliably put the Briar Queen in a back corner, put her somewhere right next to a fighter right before she goes, she inspires, and she kills somebody with 3 damage and she can follow up with more attacks. Varklov's 3 damage is a little bit less impressive, just because uh, he tends to be kind of a midline backline character that's pushing everybody else around. But occasionally in the mid to late game, you send him in, and with 2 smash 3 damage, he can get work done in a pinch. All the Chain Rasps uh, either go up to 2 damage or have some kind of cool ancillary effect. Um, so the Everhanged is 2 Smash, 2 Damage, and Cleave, and then Head Brace, Chain Rasp, is 3 Fury, 1 Damage, Knockback, 1, and Nearly Headless Nick, as I like to call him, uh, has 2 Smash, 1 Damage, Cleave, whereas the others are 2 Fury, 2 Damage. Another useful component of all these cards is that uh, even when uninspired, they treat lethal hexes as normal hexes and can move through blocked and occupied hexes as long as they end their move in an empty hex. So that means if your opponent tries to use uh, a terrain-heavy board or tries to cluster up his guys to try and prevent you from getting in on them, you can very often go through stuff and get angles on pieces that wouldn't be possible for any other warband. And with that, why don't we take a look at the deck for this match. So I definitely went with an objective heavy style with them. Because of Varklov's scaling move ability, you can very reliably stand on objectives. So I like to play greedy with my objective deck and try and swing for the fences with a bunch of tactical geniuses, tactical supremacies. Uh, 
but there's a couple of tailored cards specific to what I want to be doing here. So there's some really powerful faction-specific objectives with Death Sentence and Deathly Clutches. So Death Sentence gets you a glory immediately if three or more friendly fighters are adjacent to the same enemy fighter. It is very common for your opponent to charge in and fail to kill a Chain Rasp, or even potentially succeed depending on how the board's set up, and you Varklov push three of your Chain Rasps into adjacency with their fighter and immediately score this. Uh, you can also do this in conjunction with stuff like Hidden Paths or Sudden Appearance or cards like that uh, to make it even easier. And then the other score immediate is Deathly Clutches. So you score this immediately when two or more friendly fighters become inspired at the start of your activation. So very often you can kind of score it as an even easier version of Death Sentence, uh, though they're easier and harder in different ways. Um, I also have Martyred in there because they do start off at one dodge, so you do tend to die with your Chain Rasps early, so having some kind of early glory from failing on that is not that bad. Escalation is just kind of there because it's great. Master of War is just a good filler card. Uh, and then Shortcut, there's a lot of ways to teleport in this deck, so... Uh, might as well take advantage of it. <laughs> Moving on to the gambits, uh, I'm using a pretty heavy faction-specific uh, setup here in the gambits and the upgrades, just because I like the flavor of what they do. Uh, I've got ready fraction, of course. Uh, it's kind of well, it's ready for action. A bonus attack or move is just—it's worth a restricted slot every single time. Uh, but going into the gambits and ploys, so Howling Vortex is the only spell I take, even though the Briar Queen is Sorcerer level 2. Um, it's basically a movement ploy that's on par with Great Concussion, which is banned. And sure, it fails to go off about 11% of the time. But when it does, you get to push every enemy fighter one hex in any direction, and it doesn't all have to be the same. And that's really good for manipulating your own inspiration mechanic, for pushing people into lethal hexes, for getting enemies closer, for getting enemies further away. It's just a great catch-all card. Another standout is Drifting Advance. And this is one that I've struggled with confusion a lot, and I've seen a lot of other people struggle with. Uh, they read it, and they think it's exactly like Varklov's push, but it actually has some subtly meaningful differences. So Drifting Advance says that you push all friendly chain rasps up to two hexes. This push must take them closer to the nearest enemy fighter in each case. If there's more than one nearest enemy fighter, you can choose which the chain rasp is pushed towards. So Varklov doesn't have any of those restrictions on it. So uh, if you're adjacent to an enemy already, you can't reposition better because there's no hex that is less than one distance away from the enemy that you can push into. And so there's a lot of situations where you have to kind of time this card based on when you can use it to move your chain rasps in a way that you want. Because if you're next to an enemy, you can't move them. If you have an enemy one hex away, but you really want to move towards the one that's two hexes away, then you kind of have to manipulate pieces already. But in the early game, uh, when you're entirely on your side of the board and your opponent's entirely on their side of the board, it's basically a free action in that you get to push all of your chain rasps up you might get some inspires, and you definitely get access to some of their squishier backline pieces very reliably. Going through the rest of the play cards, we've got Filled by Fury just to more reliably make attacks alongside Endless Malice for being able to make an attack again. We've got Hidden Paths and Sudden Appearance for teleportation abilities. I love using these in conjunction with hiding the Briar Queen in your backline and then teleporting her in adjacent to somebody immediately flipping her into 3 damage, killing something, 
and forcing your opponent to either move out of her range 2 threat with a remaining piece, or just accept that it's going to die. And then to round things out, we've got Maddening Cackle, which punishes your opponent for screwing up in a key moment, and Spectral Touch, which hands out Cleave, which can be really helpful when you're sending in the Briar Queen, and you need to make sure that she's able to kill something, even if it has block or is on guard. As for upgrades, as for upgrades, we've got the Acrobatic Spectral Armor Package because all of our fighters either start at 2 dodge or become 2 dodge inspired. So being able to put a fighter up to 4 dodge is really powerful right now. I've also got Ethereal Shield, which changes your defensive characteristic from dodge to block. So for somebody that I'm not allocating all the dodge stacking resources onto, I can turn them into block and make them slightly better at surviving. I've got Shade Glass Dagger as just a nice little upgrade piece to send in a Chain Rasp who isn't that great at fighting on their own and make them into a real threat and very possibly take out a 4 health fighter like a Curse Breaker. I've also got Chill Touch, which gives the equivalent of Now and Dreadfane in Snare, so rolls of dodges aren't successes for defense rolls. It can only be put on a Chain Rasp, but if you put that on the Everhanged, who gets Cleave when inspired, now your opponent only succeeds on crits for defensive rolls. Uh, Driven by Hatred is essentially the Thorn's equivalent of Fury for Garrick's Reavers, plus one dice to their attack action when this fighter makes a charge action, which is just pretty solid when you're sending in fighters a lot. It's kind of a way to turn an upgrade slot into more reliably hitting. Face of Death is another Chain Rasp specific upgrade, and so this one says during an adjacent enemy fighter's attack action, before any dice are rolled, you roll defense die. On a roll of a shield or a crit, your opponent rolls one fewer die for that attack action to a minimum of one. And so this doesn't have to be attacking the Chain Rasp, and it doesn't uh, have to be a range one attack. They could be adjacent to you attacking somebody else. Uh, you still have a 50-50 shot of decreasing their dice pool by one, which is very often almost better than increasing your own defensive dice pool by one, in my experience, because it reduces your opponent's ability to push you around even. Uh, we've got another restricted upgrade here with uh, Inescapable Vengeance, which can only go in the Briar Queen, and this makes it so whenever she moves or charges, instead of moving her normally, you can put her on any starting hex, which is just another powerful way to give her lots of mobility and uh, helps her out if you don't draw any of your teleportation plays early but still want to send her in. Another very powerful card here is Crown of Avarice, which allows you to essentially get the glory for that fighter dying rather than your opponent, which can often be backbreaking. I like to include it in all my decks nowadays. Faded Blade is just another great upgrade for putting on a Chain Rasp. Uh, turns them from mediocre fighter into potentially being able to do 5 damage in a single attack, which can be pretty gnarly. Uh, I could also very easily see replacing this with Nullstone Spear or another Shade Glass weapon, uh, but I like the Faded Blade because I like gambling. Let's switch over to talking about Zarbag's Gits, which hold the honor of having the highest model count warband in the game because of their special deployment mechanic for their squigs. So, this warband consists of Zarbag, Snurk Sour Tongue, Drizgit to Squig Herder, Bone Hacka, Gorbaluk, Prog de Netter, Stick It, Red Cap, and Dibs. And as you'll notice, they have very similar stat lines uninspired to the Briar Queen's Thorns. Uh, they're not super fast, they're all in the three range. They all have low dodge, except for Drizgit, who has a single block. Uh, and all three are two health. Uh, and the special thing about them is that they all have a special ability called Scurry. So Scurry, it's on Zarbag, but 
all the goblins, so everyone except for the squigs in the warband, uh, gets this as well. It's a reaction that after a friendly fighter other than a squig takes a move action, uh, if they're in adjacency, they can also move. So this rewards you for playing boards that have lots of clusters of starting hexes together, so that when you move one piece, because you can do it for a move or a charge, uh, you're also able to get extra value out of it with positioning for for supporting bonuses, for objectives, etc. It really makes them kind of nasty. Drizgit the Squig Herder also has a nice scaling ability with his special action, which lets him and up to two adjacent friendly squigs each make a move action. Uh, and the ordering is entirely up to you. So if Drizgit is hiding behind his squigs and you really need him to get out from behind him, you can move the two squigs, then him. Or if you're trying to free up a squig in the back, you can move him, then the squig, etc. So that's a very powerful and helpful ability. Progdenetta has a special ability on his attack action where when it succeeds, uh, the target has one less die for all of its attack actions in their next activation. So it can be nice for tying up a fighter that's trying to go off. Snurk has a special reaction, which we'll get to more in a second, where after he activates, he becomes inspired. And he's very often considered the focus of this list, so why don't we just get into the inspired fighters? So across the board, they all get better defensive stats, except for Drizgit, who stays at one block. They mostly inspire off of just having three or more glory points. So this is everyone except for the two squigs and Snurk. The two squigs inspire if Drizgit, the squig herder, ever dies, and Snurk inspires off of his special reaction. And you get a bunch of access to cleave. And everyone's fighting stats get a little bit better in addition to their defenses. But the most interesting inspiration flip is Snurk. So Snurk gets a special ability that says, Scatter four from Sour Tongue's hex and push Sour Tongue three hexes along the chain. So this basically emulates the old Warhammer Fantasy random movement mechanic of... Night Goblin Fanatics, where they'd spin around like crazy, hopped up on mushrooms, and follow their ball and chain wherever it went. And for every hex he moves along that path, if he comes into contact with an enemy, he gets to push them, and they take a point of damage. And so it's kind of a really powerful way to ignore defensive mitigation, like dodge stacking, or things that trigger off a big attack, because this is not considered an attack. The other important thing to note is that this special action is the only thing he can do instead of moving. His movement stat becomes zero, but that makes him a prime target in addition to his three dodge for upgrades like Sudden Growth and Deathly Fortitude that try and buff your health by penalizing your movement because he doesn't use normal movement. And so if you combine dodge stacking and those health upgrades on him, you can very easily get him up to 7 health, 5 dodge. And it very quickly gets to a point where you just can't kill him. You just have to accept that he is going to spin around at random and probably kill a bunch of your guys with some help from teleportation abilities. So with that, let's just hop in real quickly to the deck. So for the objectives, we have Escalation and Master of War is just kind of evergreen good cards. Victory after victory, which requires you to score three or more objective cards in this round. Uh, shining example for your leader being inspired. It's very easy for your leader to be inspired all three rounds, so it's a very good pick. Well guarded, which you score in an end phase if your leader is adjacent to two or more friendly fighters, which between your tendency to cluster and the scurry reaction, it's very easy to score this. As for faction-specific objectives, we have Mad Scurry, which gets you two glory if you have at least five of your surviving fighters 
have made a move action in the preceding action phase, which between Scurry and Drizget is very reliable. Obliterated is a very amusing one. You get two glory if Snurk is inspired and takes an enemy fighter out of action. So if you spin somebody to death, it's an extra two bonus glory if you have this in hand. And if you focus on him correctly and give him a lot of movement agency, it's very reliable to score this in every game. Calculated Risk is a, just a generically good card. Take a board with a lethal hex, take a point of damage, get a glory immediately. Uh, keep them guessing. So you have special actions on Drizgit, and you want to be doing a lot of different things. Snurk's action is also a special action once he flips. So it's very easy to be productive in all four of your activations and still score. Keep them guessing. Martyred is helpful because, again, they have not so great stats and it's very common for them to die early. Opening Gambit is just another play a bunch of objectives, score more card. And Shortcut pairs up nicely with your tendency to try and give Snurk more movement agency. In the Gambit deck, we've got a lot of utility and control here. So Blinding Flash and Curious Inversion are designed to punish your opponent and try and limit their ability to do things on their turn. Invisible Walls does a very similar thing in limiting their movement. Distraction is a very useful card for Snurk, so it allows you to push an enemy fighter one hex, which lets you put them closer or into a better cluster for Snurk to ball up into. And then Center of Attention, Hidden Paths, Flickering Step, and Shadowed Step are all there to give Snurk more movement agency, more ability to teleport around the board, and get onto people, and do his thing. Because once he gets going, it's very hard to kill him, so if you're able to activate with him consistently over and over again, and be doing damage, you can have some very high highs with this deck. Counter Charge is also another nice piece to keep your pieces safe early uh, by essentially getting you a defensive support and move up a piece into a better position. Last chance for if you're going to die anyways, maybe just gamble on trying to save a cheap piece and essentially waste an opponent's activation. In the upgrade deck, we've got two, essentially two automatic glory with Destiny Meat and Slumbering Key, because Snurk virtually never dies. You just put those both on him, and since they're not going to be able to kill him with much ease, it's very easily scored. Acrobatics and Spectral Armor for the defensive stacking package. This works decently on most of your fighters, as a bunch of them get up to dodge too, but it can be downright oppressive on Snurk. Deathly Fortitude uh, is taken here. Not both Deathly Fortitude and Sudden Growth, so Snurk can only get up to 5 health, 5 dodge, but that's already more than enough. Uh, if you're facing a bunch of spell-heavy decks, it might be a good idea to take both, because since they bypass defense, uh, having raw health can really stop them from trying to machine gun you down. Though with the updated restricted lists limiting how much spell casters can do that, it's not a huge worry in our local experience. Uh, Crown of Avarice is just a generically good card, and then Faded Blade, Mutating Maul are there to tune up your mediocre fighters into something really scary. Quickening Greaves is also a nice utility card for Snurk. So if you play that towards the end of a round, say round one, you get to push at the end of round one and the beginning of round two, and now Snurk is two hexes closer to where he wants to be for his next activation. And it also lets you get last minute pushes onto objectives. And in general, if you can afford it in your upgrade slots, it's a very good card. Fainway Crystal is another kind of nice get onto objective, have mobility, and be able to get onto your opponent's backline when you really need to card. 
Uh, and all in all, it rounds out into kind of a nice mix of tuning up your weak horde fighters, keeping Snurk alive, and adding to your mobility abilities. And so that wraps up our deck tech. If you click the link here, or just wait until the video ends, we'll send you right back to the battle.